basically what we went over. Again, this this is just reiteration of what we had just talked about. But I think that it's beneficial, especially when you're talking about stuff like this, to kind of write it down first, and then it makes more sense. So now we can kind of skim through the diagrams. The diagrams are what I always tell you guys about. It's like you can look at the picture, but you do really need to be able to explain it. And if I'm just explaining it to you and showing you the picture, I think uh, sometimes it's, it, it's not as active of a learning experience. So that's why I wanted you to write it down. And if anything, that should give you a little bit of the opportunity to see some of the ways in which you can study for this class. And you go back and you can, you can actually write down, you can try to do, draw out the bonds and so forth. So today we're just talking about the structure and function of the atom and chemical bonding. On Thursday, we're going to talk about acids and bases and the macromolecules. And then uh, today, I think we're also going to talk a little bit about water and its properties. I think we should have some time for that. So, as I mentioned, in this chapter, we're looking at the simplest level of organization and how these atoms come together to form molecules. And then ultimately, in chapters three and six, we're gonna be talking about the cellular level. End of chapter one, we talked about tissues. But after we get through these parts, we'll be getting into the organ systems as, um, as we progress through the class. So first of all, we said that atoms consist of a nucleus, which contains our protons and neutrons. And then outside of the atom, we have the electrons. Um, and we know that the protons have a positive charge, neutrons are neutral, and electrons have a negative charge. And these electrons occupy shells, and we can fit two electrons in the first shell and eight electrons in every shell thereafter. Atomic mass is the sum of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. And, um, the atomic number is the number of protons, which indirectly tells us the number of electrons, like we talked about before. So again, here we have the examples that we, we drew on the board. Hydrogen has one proton. That's its atomic what? Number. number. And in this case, I mean, there's no neutron, so it also tells us its... Atomic weight? Its mass, right? Its weight. And actually, if you look on the periodic table up here, See how it says, it says, it says, see the blue one that's beside it? That's its atomic number. But if you look below where it says 1.00795, that's its atomic mass. But as I mentioned before, even though it only has one proton and no neutron, that's why you have a one, because that's the largest weight. But you do also have a zero, zero, point zero, zero, seven, nine, five, because even though you know the protons and neutrons make up most of everything, the electrons do have a little teeny bit of weight, though it's negligible. But that's why it's not just one, like we said. But for our purposes, it's fine. Um, and then uh, carbon has an atomic mass of what? You see here, you've got six protons, neutrons, and electrons. What's, what is it? What's the, what's the weight of carbon? 12. Was, is, well, remember the mass is the number of protons and the number of neutrons, and we have six of each, so you add that together, it's 12. And its atomic number, though, is what? Six, because it has six protons, and we have six electrons from, from that. We know that we have that. Um, okay, so mentioned before that the electron shells are in layers around the nucleus, the number of shells depends on the atomic number. So let me, let me, uh, let me quiz you here, let's see what you think. Okay, so we've got, let's see here. Okay, helium, its atomic number is two. How many shells is it going to have? One. Is it going to be able to bond with any other atoms? No. In fact, the number of valence electrons that you have, right, 
and however many electrons you need, that's going to determine the number of bonds. Think about it. Carbon had an atomic number of six. First shell had two, the second shell four. And how many bonds can carbon form? Four more, because we need four more electrons. So the number of electrons you need determines the number of bonds you're going to have. In helium's case, which is a noble gas, helium doesn't have any valence electrons. Its shell is full. Likewise, what about neon? Neon has an atomic number of 10. Doesn't need any more. It has two electrons in the first shell. How many in the second? Eight. It's full. So actually, if you look down here, argon, um, xenon, all of these, all of these are our noble gases, and those do not bond with anything else and are definitely not found in our bodies, <laughs> not naturally. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, electron shells, they are in layers around the nucleus. The number of shells depends on the atomic number, as we said. If you just have an atomic number of one, you're only gonna have one shell. If you have an atomic number of six, you have two shells. Um, the first shell contains two electrons and the second one can contain up to eight. And the electrons in the more distant shells have higher energy. It's a lot like when kids go to college, you know, further away from home you get, further from the nucleus, the wilder you can be. Probably not applicable here. So valence electrons, as I said, are those in the outermost shell which participate in chemical bonds. And however many, however many electrons you need in the outer shell is how many bonds you can actually form. How many bonds could oxygen form with another atom? Two, because it had an atomic number of eight. So two electrons in the first shell, six in the second. You need two more electrons, you can form two more bonds. And we had two examples in there, O2, oxygen, where we had a double bond. And we had um, H2O, I think, which if you look at that, it had two single bonds with hydrogen, right? Okay, so uh, one thing we didn't talk about is what an isotope is. Okay, so carbon's a great example of an isotope. Um, isotopes basically, by definition, are atoms where you have the same atomic number, which means you have the same number of what component? Protons. You have the same number of protons in every form of the atom, but, and which means they have the same number of electrons too, but the neutron numbers are different. So, for example, if we have carbon 12, like we had talked about, um, carbon 12 an atomic number of six, so it has six protons, six electrons, and it had six neutrons, right? So that's why it's carbon 12. Six and six is 12. But we also have carbon 13 and carbon 14, and then we have isotopes that are lower, like carbon uh, 10. I think we have carbon 10. If we were, if we had carbon 14, okay, how many protons would we have in the carbon atom? Still six, right? Because the atomic number is the same. Atomic number is always six. So we have six protons, which means we have six electrons, because they gotta be neutral. But the neutron number is different. Remember, it's carbon-14. So how many neutrons will we have? How many? I really wish, I, I so wish I could draw on the board because it eight. would look better. Yes, eight. The question was, how many, how many neutrons will carbon-14 have? So carbon, doesn't matter which isotope, same atomic number, six, 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 doesn't matter. So that means that they all have six protons, all have six electrons. The only thing that changes is the neutron number. Carbon-14 is considered to be a heavy isotope because it has a, a larger weight. It's heavier than carbon-12, which is like the stable isotope. Carbon-14 
um, is something that we use a lot of times like in fossil dating. Uh, it is not a stable isotope. It's unstable and it means that it degrades. It has a half-life. It means that it will, within a certain period of time, it will degrade by half. And I think it's something like 5,738 years or something. So if we see a fossil, see we have carbon-14 in our atmosphere, so there's a fixed number of carbon-14 in our bones when we die. If you see a bone or you see a fossil and you see that it has half the amount of carbon-14 in it that it's supposed to, then we know it's 5,738 years old or whatever, right? So, but see, carbon-14 is only good for more recent um, fossils and things. Some things that are, you know, millions and millions of years old, we need to use other isotopes that have longer half-lives. So that's where isotopes come into play. Do you understand? It's just all atoms of, of the same isotope have the same atomic number, which means they have the same number of protons, which means they have the same number of electrons, but the neutron number is different, which makes the mass different. Question about that? No. All right. So chemical bonding. Uh, basically, we know that molecules form chemical bonds between valence electrons. The number of bonds, as I mentioned earlier, is determined by the number of electrons you need to complete the shell. The four types of bonds we talked about, the first one, um, covalent, we have nonpolar, which is the most stable one. Electrons are shared equally here and I showed you hydrogen. Um, each hydrogen has one electron that they're sharing with another hydrogen. So each are sharing half of their electrons, which makes it very stable and very solid. Um, I also showed you methane as an example of that. Polar covalent bonds, uh, a little less stable. Electrons are still being shared here, but unequally. So water was our example. We have oxygen and hydrogen. And because oxygen has a, it's not because oxygen is a, it's bigger, it's just that oxygen has less to share. It only has to share a quarter of its electrons with hydrogen. Hydrogen is sharing half. Therefore, oxygen gets greedy and wants more of that electron, and so at certain moments uh, is going to make hydrogen a little bit more positive, making oxygen slightly more negative. Other atoms which have a strong pool are things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which we really don't talk about any molecules in this class that contain that. But essentially any atom that is sharing uh, less of its electrons with another atom in this kind of unequal arrangement can form a nonpolar, or I'm sorry, a polar covalent bond. And then ionic bonding, this shows you what I tried to draw on the board, <coughs> sodium and chlorine. Sodium has an atomic number of 11 and its outer shell is almost completely empty. Chlorine has an almost completely full outer shell. So sodium will just give its electron to chlorine making sodium positive by one, because as it shows here, we started out with 11 electrons, but we lost one. We still have 11 protons, so we're positive by one. And that makes sodium an A+, which is our cation in this. That's what we call it. Whereas the chlorine becomes a chloride ion because it gains this electron. And we started out with 17 protons, which means we had 17 electrons, but now we have 18 electrons and 17 protons. So we're negative by one. And that makes the chlorine a chloride ion, which is our anion, the negative ion. And this is nice because it shows us what I tried to explain earlier Water is a great solvent, especially for ionic compounds like sodium chloride, because the water, remember, has a slight positive charge on hydrogen, slight negative charge on oxygen. 
And what will happen is, is whenever water comes in contact with an ionic compound, it'll take, for example, the sodium, the cation, the slightly negatively charged oxygen will surround it and form these hydration spheres. Likewise, the water will orient itself differently around our anion. The slightly positive hydrogen um, mole or atoms are gonna uh, orient themselves to separate out the anion. And again, these are called hydration spheres. And they separate the ions from each other and they don't come back together again. So when we talk about physiology and we're talking about any, you know, sodium and chloride and sodium potassium pump and all of that, that's how we actually arrive at these, at these ions that we're gonna be dis describing. And, uh, okay, I think after this slide I'll stop and then I'll just pick up with hydrogen bonds uh, in the next class. Two things I did not explain to you earlier um, that are listed here, a couple of terms the term hydrophilic and the term hydrophobic. Anything that is a file, it likes something. Okay, so when you see that suffix, that means that it, something loves something. In this case, we're talking about water-loving molecules, hydrophilic molecules. These are things that can interact with water and they, they're soluble, like sodium chloride, because hydration spheres can form easily. Hydrophobic, Phobia means to fear. In this case, these things don't like water. They can't interact well. So lipids, so things like waxes, triglycerides, cholesterol, you know, any of that kind of stuff doesn't interact. We, um, we can also, well, we'll just use the terms hydrophilic and hydrophobic, I think, for now. Do you have any questions? So again, that was just repetition from what we did, what we talked about on the board. Okay, Thursday then we'll pick up with uh, the hydrogen bonds, finish up this first part and talk about acids and bases and get into the macromolecules if you wanted to look ahead. First quiz will be on uh, Thursday, beginning of class, and it's going to cover just what we talked about last Thursday, remember. So it's going to cover everything in chapter one basically that we reviewed before we started on um, that keratinized and non-keratinized stuff. That won't be on there, um, and connective tissues won't be on there. Uh, but yeah, basically everything else from chapter one will be. All right, anything else?